Hello everyone and welcome to yet another episode of Real History. I am history professor Jared Frederick. Glad that you can join us for our next installment as we analyze the subsequent episode of Band of Brothers. This episode is entitled Crossroads and we find Easy Company of the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment of the 101st Airborne Division on this ominous sliver of terrain that is known vaguely as the island. It is a number of weeks after the failed attempt to cross over into Germany via Operation Market Garden. This was hoped to be a very optimistic endeavor that would hopefully bring an end to the war by Christmas, but the Germans had other plans and our members of Easy Company find themselves in the wake of this German rebuttal to the Allied advance. This episode continues into October and November of 1944 as a degree of stalemate ensues as both sides are weighing each other out and what results really is just this constant shuffle of attack, counterattack, moving forward and enemy responding to that accordingly. Our main character in this episode is the main protagonist of the series, Captain Dick Winters, and he will be finding himself in a very precarious and challenging situation here, especially regarding his action on October 5th, 1944. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and check out Crossroads in Band of Brothers. Hi everybody, Andrew here, the other half of the Real History team. I'm usually behind the camera. But I'm here to speak with you tonight about the fact that we are at, as of filming this, 500 subscribers, uh, quick on our way to 1,000. And I just wanted to let you know that if you're watching this and not subscribed, uh, click the button down there and make it happen because I have something special planned for when we get there. Back to Jared. Finally. It's a very tense opening to the episode. You don't even have a sense of what's going on and already the tension mounts. Uh, and you have a sense that there's something really momentous hanging in the balance. And then this recurring theme throughout the episode. Powerful. So this finds us exactly one month after Operation Market Garden commenced. The 101st Airborne Division had fought a number of battles big and small, in the interim. Um, and now there was a, a lot of waiting and a lot of uncertainty as to what would happen next. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Oh. <laughs> in these sorts of scenes, you really get a sense of the brotherly affection that Winters and Lewis Nixon had for one another. Uh, and it, it's the, the perfect sort of allegory for the the title of the series itself, um, because indeed, for as different as these two men were, they did in fact view each other in a very brotherly manner. Market Garden fell on its ass, which is why Colonel Doby has been tasked with coordinating some kind of rescue operation for the Red Devils who were trapped when Autumn fell. By this point, Dick Winters is the executive officer for 2nd Battalion, and so he answers to uh, Strayer, his superior. And uh, scenes like this help convey to the audience the overarching strategic situation. And what we get a sense of in these scenes is the origins of what becomes known as Operation Pegasus, which will take place October 22nd and into October 23rd, 1944. It was a very daring rescue operation. Uh, many hundreds of uh, British paratroopers had been uh, left behind in the wake of their defeat at Arnhem. And for the following month, uh, these stalwart members of the Dutch resistance offered them safe harbor, uh, waiting for the Allied advance to come a little bit nearer to the moment when those beleaguered British paratroopers could be rescued. Uh, when they talk about the Alliance, this is exactly the sort of collaborative endeavor that they're talking about. Uh, 
Um, this building is known as the Skunderlacht Estate. It still stands to this very day, and many people go and recreate the famous photograph of Dick Winters uh, standing in front of it in October or November 1944. There you go. What you call it, Tap? Trigger. Of course, I like that. Another friendship that the series doesn't really delve into with much depth is the special bond that Winters had with Floyd Talbert, who we see in, in these scenes. Um, Winters very much saw him as a little brother, and although Winters did not often very closely associate with a lot of his enlisted men, he, he got to know them on a first-name basis in some circumstances, but he always kind of kept arm's length for obvious reason. Um, but Floyd Talbert had this really uh, warm and endearing sensibility that Winters found very uh, appealing, and uh, the two of them would go hunting later on in the war, and we'll elaborate upon their friendship a little bit further later on in the series. It's important to note that Tom Hanks directed this episode, uh, and many of you may be well aware that Tom Hanks has a real affinity for typewriters. And uh, sure enough, a typewriter plays a very important role um, from a thematic and plot perspective in this episode. Um, this episode is perhaps my favorite out of Band of Brothers because it uses flashback, it talks about historical memory, and people trying to make sense of what they've gone through. Uh, and that's really what the essence of the World War II experience is. Uh, people's recollections sometimes conflicting with one another, and people like myself as a historian, likewise, trying to interpret those words and actions all these years later. These actions here showing our characters meandering through uh, the Dutch darkness uh, places us about October 4th going into October 5th, uh, 1944. This segment of Easy Company had been sent out essentially on a reconnaissance mission to probe and trying to find out enemy strength and positions. And amidst all of this, Dick Winters, being the strong tactical thinker that he was, will ultimately see an opportunity. It seems like this that perfectly capture the, the essence, the, the the topographical nature, if you will, of the Holland countryside. Um, it was just kind of these endless waves of ripples, uh, these dikes and these undulations going up and down. Uh, it, it, it made for really hellish circumstances as these troops of both sides were maneuvering, probing, trying to find each other, um, especially at night. According to Dick Winters' report that he penned on October 17, 1944, as he was remembering these events of October 5th, um, it happened just exactly as he described and as is depicted here in the series. Uh, he assigned targets for his men. This was all about precision. Um, this was all about striking at the enemy quickly so that they would have very little time to react. And it unfolds with great effect as such. Ah! Fuck! Dukeman's down! Great sound bridge, superb editing and sound editing uh, that we see in, in some of these segments. Really superbly done. Why doesn't Tom Hanks direct more? I don't understand. They can have flank us along the dike and catch us out here as soon as they figure that out. Though subtle, this too is a really great scene because it shows us the, the tactical gears inside of Winters' mind starting to turn. How can he turn this potentially disastrous situation into something that will benefit he and his men? And he said in his October 17th report, which we see him composing throughout this episode, the situation at this time found us in a position where we weren't receiving a great deal of fire, but with our small force we could not hope to build up a static line of defense, which wasn't in the tactical position to start with. If we were hit, we had no line of withdrawal which would be of any value to us. 
Also, it appeared that the enemy was over the dike and would be cutting us if nothing was done. The decision was made to make a bayonet charge. Why don't you just give it up? Drinking. No. Hiding it in my foot locker. Nixon struggled for many years after the war with his alcoholism until he uh, eventually married his third wife, uh, who helped to uh, get him uh, settled down and on a healthier track. All that being said, uh, the alcoholic beverage of that 69, I dare to say, has become synonymous uh, with his reputation during World War II in the years since Band of Brothers has come out. So it's a very interesting legacy indeed. And here comes the big moment. Wait for the signal. One of, uh, one of the differences between this depiction and what actually occurred uh, is that as far as Winters could remember, his men started running with him at the very same moment. They did not delay. But Winters was such a fast runner that none of his men could keep up with him. And as he later recalled, uh, Winters was in this state of, of hyper-focus, this heightened state of awareness. Um, you know, he said, you know, his, his heart and his mind was pumping. Um, that he'd never been in a mental state like this before and had never been in a state like that ever again. And it all builds up to his run up this embankment where he encounters this lone German soldier and starts emptying his M1 Grand clip after clip into ostensibly a full company of German SS troops. Um, it's an incredible moment of bravery. He and his men attacked this group of Germans, as uh, Winters recalls, in three different columns. And as the second column arrived on the scene, started pouring fire into the enemy, uh, the third column came up and slammed into the flank of the enemy, mowing them down even further. Amidst all of this confusion, Another company of Germans sweeps over the, the top of another dike and walks straight into this calamity that we see unfolding here. The Americans are drastically outnumbered, but they had the element of surprise. They had a fairly good defensive position. Uh, the Germans had been resting in this enclosure where they were under the impression that they had cover and concealment to an extent. And Dick Winters and these few squads of riflemen proved quite otherwise. Uh, Dick Winters thought of this moment as the acme of his men's heroism. And recalling on this episode years later, he really thought that it was his finest moment in combat, perhaps even surpassing that of his assault on Braycourt Manor on D-Day. Uh, so it's some really incredible stuff. There's a, a great degree of authenticity gone into the recreation um, of this attack. Uh, Tom Hanks really did his homework. Uh, and it's little wonder that he wanted to direct this episode, considering that Winters thought it was his most important moment of the Second World War. Jesus, Captain, they're SS. Colonel Sink remarked of this moment in a public relations announcement shortly after this attack. By this daring act and skillful maneuver against a numerically superior force, the use of an important road junction was denied the enemy in the withdrawal across the Nieder Rhine River. Also, heavy casualties were inflicted upon them by this small force. And so this was yet another moment in which uh, Dick Winters would get some good press. Uh, there would be you know, some features in his hometown newspaper back in Lancaster, Pennsylvania uh, regarding this action. Uh, but surprisingly, um, Winters was never decorated. Uh, for this act of gallantry, uh, which uh, you might be considering is somewhat strange, and perhaps it is. You drop a prisoner, the rest will jump you. I want all prisoners back a battalion CP alive. This too is something that Winters actually did. Uh, Lieb got throughout the war uh, certainly had no great sympathy for German prisoners, and we'll see that later on at another point in the series too. I believe I said that. 
Can you make it back to ZP? Yeah. I will see you someplace else. We'll be talking a lot more about David Webster at a, a later point. Uh, but it's important to note, um, these GIs were such avid scroungers and souvenir hunters. Even as Webster was hobbling back to the aid station, uh, he saw a camouflaged German poncho laying on the ground. And he thought, hmm, that would make a fine souvenir for my nephew. And so he went over, picked it up, tucked it under his arm, and went to the aid station with that battlefield trophy. And so even when these men were bleeding and in pain, the idea of gathering souvenirs to take back home or to send to loved ones back in the States was ever on their mind. You can read this report and many other pieces of Dick Winter's correspondence in uh, the book that I co-wrote with my friend Eric Dorr entitled Hang Tough. Lots of good stories about Dick Winters and the Band of Brothers in this volume. Check it out if you're interested. 22 wounded, huh? You okay? Yeah, one killed. Who? Dukeman. In addition to Dukeman being killed, there were four Americans wounded in this attack. And when you consider the toll that was inflicted on the opposing SS troops, you could consider it something of a small miracle that they were able to pull it off in the way that they did. And uh, Dick Winters' men, uh, as if they didn't have enough admiration for him already, this heightened it to a whole other level. And uh, Dick Winters reciprocated that admiration uh, it instilled in he and his comrades uh, a sense of camaraderie that would never be broken. O October 5th was one of those watershed moments that really cemented that notion in their minds for the rest of their lives. How'd you feel about handling the battalion? Sir? I'm moving you up to executive officer, second battalion. Although this promotion that Winters received was uh, meant to be an honor, a reward for his good work, uh, Winters felt that it was somewhat of a punishment because he had such a attachment and such a sense of kinship to the men in Easy Company. Uh, and he was really not meant to be a, a bureaucrat. He did not enjoy red tape. He did not enjoy flying a desk or sitting in front of a typewriter. Uh, he felt that his use as an officer as such was a, a waste of his skills his training, everything that he and his men had prepared for. And in scenes like this, where we see him stuck in this Dutch attic, you really get a sense of that agitation that he feels um, in, you know, handling the paperwork. Easy's in good hands. Yeah. Yeah, right. Well, hang tough. Hang tough. He's a great one-liner. I love it. Heiliger, 506 at the 101st Airport. Never thought I'd be so glad to see a bloody yank. Your show, Colonel. I'll be back shortly. This rescue operation of October 22nd, 23rd, 1944, as I said, codenamed Operation Pegasus, um, is yet another one of these really daring moments. And it didn't really serve any, you know, strong tactical purpose. Um, it was really about doing what was right. Uh, rescuing these men who had given their all at Arnhem had lived this month of uncertainty, uh, essentially behind German lines. And uh, this was an operation taken not out of strategic necessity, but moral imperative. Uh, one of the young men who participated in Operation Pegasus is this uh, gentle Mississippian who is still alive today named Bradford Freeman. Uh, he is pushing 100 years old. He is the last surviving enlisted man of Easy Company. And I've had the pleasure of meeting him a few times, and uh, he recalls back on this moment as an episode that is uh, one of the, those that is most meaningful to him uh, in his wartime experiences because uh, he too realized that it was part of a higher purpose of saving these guys who deserve to be saved. Moose Heiliger and the American 101st have done the Red Devils a great service. You can see Tom Hanks in a really small cameo here 
uh, amongst these British paratroopers. Next time you watch Band of Brothers, stop at this spot, hit pause, and play Where's Tom Hanks. Ian's company before that Sobels. Yeah, but you trust your non-coms. Halt! It's moved! <laughs> Hold your fire! On Halloween night, 1944, uh, winners and Fred Moose Heiliger uh, went out to do some surveying of the line. And uh, although I don't believe it was along a railroad tracks, it was more so uh, amidst some brush. Like we see here, a guard called out for the password. And uh, Winters remembers this moment with you know, uh, crystal clarity. He knew immediately that Heiliger had forgotten the password. Heiliger froze. He hesitated. And he was about to call out, it's Moose. He was going to yell out his nickname to this guard. But before he could do so, a bullet struck him in the shoulder and in the leg and he bled profusely. After being shot, Heiliger had six transfusions of blood. This is how close he came to death after being shot by one of his own men. Uh, but amidst all of this, he had the frame of mind to nonetheless hand off his sidearm and his jump wings to Winters because he did not want to lose them. He handed them off knowing that they would be in good hands uh, in, in Winters' care. Um, and it just goes to show how precious that idea of jump wings were to these men. They're on the verge of dying and they take off this pin and they say, here buddy, take this for me. It's a revealing moment. Uh, Heiliger spent many, many months in recuperation. Uh, his entire body was in a cast, essentially. Uh, and uh, it, it was a long, painful journey for him. Uh, but he lived the better part of another half a century. And uh, even all of those years later, he still couldn't remember the password. <laughs> In these scenes, we see Easy Company at Camp Mormelon Le Grand, France, uh, which is a relatively short distance away from Reims. Uh, later on in the war, Reims would become uh, the advanced headquarters for uh, Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, but at this moment in the war, it is uh, essentially a place for rest and recuperation uh, among GIs who had been on the front lines for a long time. Uh, there was a hope that here at Camp Mormelon they would be able to settle into winter hibernation. There was still a hope that the Germans were on their last limb, but once again the Germans have a, a trick up their sleeve, as we'll be finding out shortly. One of the other things that uh, the men of the 101st Airborne Division were looking to forward to while they were in Mormelon uh, was a highly anticipated football game that was scheduled between the 502nd and the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiments. This was to be known as the Champagne Bowl. And uh, such was the level of expectation for it that they even printed out program booklets uh, for it. And, uh, you know, it was going to be a nice little Christmas time reprieve. Uh, but it was scheduled for December 17th, and uh, the troops weren't going to be moving across the gridiron that day. They were going to be heading to the Ardennes instead. Sir, there's a Sergeant Garnier here to see you. Look what the train brought in. Hey, hey the daredevil. Hey, Captain. Welcome back, Bill. The reemergence of Bill Garnier here is a kind of funny thing because um, the audience isn't really let in on what happened to this guy. Um, what did happen to Garnier is that he had been wounded by a German sniper in Holland in mid-October of 1944 as he was joyriding on a liberated motorcycle. And uh, he broke his tibia in the midst of all of that. He took some shrapnel to the back. And uh, as a result, he was sent back to England to recuperate, to heal, and to recover. But he was so worried that he would be transferred to a different unit 
that he was bound to go AWOL. Uh, and for doing this, uh, he was court-martialed and he was demoted. He was busted to the rank of private. Um, but he said that he would keep going AWOL uh, in order for him to get back to easy company. And so how did he get out of all this? Well, one story goes that he painted his cast with shoe polish in order to get out of the hospital. Um, and eventually, the, the staff at the hospital uh, realized that they couldn't play ball with this guy. And he, he was, in fact, sent back to the Netherlands where he reconnects with Easy Company, as we see here. And so if you're wondering why Garnier's character has a limp, now you know the story. General Taylor has flown back to Washington. He's left General McAuliffe in charge of the division. You, my friend, are headed to Paris. City of light. That's the departure of General Maxwell Taylor to go back to Washington uh, was uh, poorly timed on his part. And uh, I think it's a, a case of fate uh, that he long regretted for the, the rest of his career because as a result he would miss perhaps the most iconic battle that his beloved division would participate in. While he was visiting in Paris, Dick Winters was doing uh, all the touristy things that people do when they go to visit the City of Light. Uh, and he wrote to his pen pal, Dieta Allman, back in the States describing some of the things that he was doing. He got a tour of the Eiffel Tower. Uh, you know, he saw where, you know, uh, famous people had been executed and all this sort of grisly history uh, as he recorded it to her. And he greatly enjoyed his time there. Uh, it was lighthearted. Things were still very celebratory. It had only been a few months earlier uh, that the city had been liberated uh, from the Allies. And uh, Dick Winters just really soaked it up. Uh, little did he know that only days away, he would embark on the next momentous campaign of his military career. Some more fantastic editing here. And all of this is a build-up to what I think of as the, the sublime moment of truth that we see in this film. This was a moment that kept replaying in Dick Winters' mind. He could not escape it, even after all of these years later. And in my book, I, I chronicle this moment with some of his own, with his own words. With his men yards behind, Winters jumped atop a dike alone and stood before two companies of unsuspecting Germans. I'm in a different state of mind that I've never been in before, he confessed. I hope never to get there again. He described this surreal sensation as being pumped up. His next actions remain long ingrained in his memories. In jumping up on the dike, he continued, there's this young soldier right across the road from me. He was directly on the other side of that road from me, about two steps away, because it was just a narrow dirt road coming up from the river. The young German combatant was a lookout, an obviously ineffective one. That was his job, to keep them informed. He didn't do it. And I came up directly across from him, eyeball to eyeball. And he was just as shocked as could be. I leveled off at him, said Winters. The thing I can never forget was that he smiled. And as he smiled, I shot him. I think of this as the, the ultimate moment of truth for our protagonist in the series because although the film depicts him as this statue-like leader uh, who never had any sort of reservations, never hesitated, indeed that's how his men saw him, but it's not always how Winters saw himself. This is one of the few moments in the film where Dick Winters is a vulnerable character. He's an emotionally vulnerable character. And it makes him all the more human as a result. That is what makes it 
so powerful. And in that one instance, as Winters is trying to cope with what he has done, we get a sense of his inner self. How are you feeling? Oh, it's just a little. It wounds hell. All four of them. Buck. Buck Compton had been wounded in the backside during Operation Market Garden, as you may recall. And this scene here uh, foreshadows his uh, eventual breakdown during the Ardennes campaign in the coming weeks. Um, as soldiers said, it would just sometimes sneak up on you, incrementally eating away at your ability to function as a soldier. Uh, and, you know, this is, you know, no discredit or shame upon Buck Compton. Uh, many men would face this emotional fatigue. There was only so much to human endurance that one could contend with. Elements of the 1st and the 6th SS Panzer Division have broken through in the Ardennes Forest. Now they've overrun the 28th Infantry and elements of the 4th. My grandfather was among those men in the 4th Infantry Division who were in Luxembourg at this time who were partially overrun by this sudden onslaught into this dreary, wintry aura uh, known as the Ardennes Forest. What the Germans had hoped to do here on the eve of Christmas time was to reverse Allied advances uh, as they were moving uh, eastward. Uh, across the continent. Uh, hopefully they could, uh, in their minds, cut the British and the American forces in two, drive to the port city of Antwerp, Belgium, and reverse everything that had happened since D-Day. Hundreds of thousands of Germans would pour into Belgium and Luxembourg. There were uh, recuperating and uh, fresh American divisions located in that sector and they were dramatically overwhelmed by this sudden incursion. The 101st Airborne would be among countless American divisions, um, as well as British troops to the north, who often don't get their due credit here during the Ardennes Offensive, to respond to this seemingly drastic emergency. At this hour, though, when all seems so glum, Dwight Eisenhower saw not a threat, but opportunity. He was of the mind that the Germans are going to be coming out into the open. They're heading right toward us. Let's turn the tables on them. That was going to be one of the overarching Allied objectives of what would become known as the Battle of the Bulge. I guess the blackout's not in effect. Luftwaffe must be asleep. This ride to the front from Mormolon Le Grand was a very memorable one for the men of the 101st Airborne Division. Uh, it, it was miserable. It was rocky. It was bumpy. It was uh, freezing. Uh, soon uh, snow showers would, would start to fall. And all of these things were an uneasy prognosticator of what was to hinder them in the weeks and months to come. So a very uncomfortable ride. Uh, but the one saving grace amidst their journey, uh, and uh, Lieutenant Ronald Spears later recalled this, he said it, it, the trip was really uneasy on the bladder, but at least the German Air Force didn't strafe our trucks as we were moving toward the Ardennes. Some good GI improvisation here to stay warm. This area is known as Bastogne. Strategic crossroads town. Seven roads leading in, seven roads leading out. So we can see from this orientation being provided by Colonel Sink that the narrative of this episode has shifted from one crossroads to another. From Holland to Belgium as the company transitions from one campaign to the next. Bastogne would become a crucial crossroads during the Battle of the Bulge. As Colonel Sink said, um, several major roads intersected there. It would be only one of several pivot points on which uh, the Battle of the Bulge would hinge. Uh, the celebrity and the daring of the 101st Airborne's uh, stalwart defense of this area um, leads many people to the belief that like, this was 
like the giver, you know, take all moment um, in the campaign. Um, but it was only a fraction of the much bigger story. And as we take this campaign in its totality, it's sometimes important for us to remember that. What the hell is going on? Are you going the wrong way? What we see here are troops of the battered 28th Infantry Division uh, falling back. Uh, and Dick Winters had a rather harsh perspective of these soldiers who were retreating. You know, in fact, Dick Winters said he was embarrassed of them. I think this may be a little bit unfair on Winters' part to make such a harsh judgment. While he and his men were fairly snug right outside of Reims, France, the 28th Infantry Division was having the snot beat out of it in the Hurtgen Forest. Um, and so to be so dismissive of these battered troops as they go immediately from one campaign into the next, I think is uh, perhaps um, a little bit too unfair. Make a hole, hey! Make a hole! I got ammo! What's your name, Lieutenant? George Rice, 10th Armor. And here we see a brief cameo by uh, comedian Jimmy Fallon while he was still on Saturday Night Live. And he plays a lieutenant from the 10th Armored Division named George Rice, who, as we see here in this scene, uh, delivers much needed ammunition and grenades uh, to these paratroopers as they're heading into this famous battle. Uh, as a funny side note, uh, Jimmy Fallon has uh, later said on his television show uh, that he had never driven a Jeep before. Um, and they essentially needed to push this Jeep um, into the scene um, because his operation of it uh, was that clunky. Uh, and so there was uh, some pressure on him as an actor, despite this being a very small scene, um, because that everybody was watching him. And he too felt <laughs> really embarrassed as a result. But George Rice, his character, certainly did his part. And that's the important part to remember. And off they go to additional fame. This is probably my favorite episode of Band of Brothers. Uh, for all the reasons I mentioned more, uh, it shows a, a real strong degree of humanity uh, on the part of the main character of, of Dick Winters. Uh, we, we really get his perspective in a, in a truly intimate way uh, in this episode. And of course, it's, it's set up as well uh, for uh, an even bigger moment for the 101st Airborne Division. If you're interested in learning more about these various episodes, I'd be uh, happy to recommend another book for you, uh, written by my friend Larry Alexander, and it is entitled In the Footsteps of the Band of Brothers. And uh, what is valuable about this book is that it examines uh, the life and the memories of a, a paratrooper who doesn't quite get his uh, full share of fame in the television depiction of his unit's exploits. Uh, but it looks at the story of paratrooper Forrest Guth, uh, who returned to these European battlefronts uh, 65 years after he had fought there. Uh, and it offers a really humbling perspective. Uh, it's a story of both a young man and an old man, as he too like winners in this episode, is trying to come to terms with what he had endured in his youth. So check it out in the footsteps of the Band of Brothers, if you'd like a little bit more insight. That wraps real history up for this time. Join us for our next episode as the 101st Airborne digs in for its rugged defense of this Belgian crossroads town of Bastogne.